when Nancy Pelosi touched down in Taiwan, the lawless mainland communist government of China threw a fit. Does their overreaction mean that the United States should overtly pledge in advance to fight against China if it invades Taiwan? Looking back at home, is the rule of law threatened by the recent FBI raid at Mar-a-Lago? And hey, let's hear it for the latest miracle political words. It's called the Inflation Reduction Act, even though it will likely ramp up inflation. We will discuss all this and more in today's episode of Independent Health. Hello, everybody. I'm Graham Walker coming to you today from the Independent Institute in Oakland, California, right across the bay from San Francisco, where we try to bring you an independent take on the issues of the day. As always, I am joined by my colleague and partner in crime, Dr. Williamson Evers. Hi, Bill. How are you? Fine. Great to see you. Uh, Bill is the director of our Center on Educational Excellence. And today also, we are joined by Dr. Ivan Eland, who is the center director of our Center on Peace and Liberty. Hello, Ivan. Hi, Graham. Pleasure to have you with us today. And let me remind our many friends who may be watching this that uh, Ivan Eland is also the author of the book, War and the Rogue Presidency, Restoring the Republic After Congressional Failure, in which he lays out some of his very interesting findings and constitutional arguments about the war-making power. <clears throat> A good read. I highly recommend it. And of course, I always invite all of our friends uh, to visit us at our website, independent.org, for the latest resources. But today, <clears throat> today, we are going to be talking about, first of all, uh, the visit from U.S. Speaker uh, Nancy Pelosi, visit, visit her, her first ever visit, <clears throat> Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, uh, first visit in 25 years of a sitting House Speaker to the island of Taiwan, uh, provoking the ire of the government on the mainland, um, I noticed that uh, this issue, although it has dropped off the, the headlines of newspapers these days, Ivan, uh, in favor, apparently, of stories about some kind of a beluga whale caught in the Seine River in France. I'm reading a lot more about the beluga whale this week, past two days than I have about the situation in Taiwan. But am I, am I right that there are continuing Chinese military exercises in and around Taiwan after Speaker Pelosi's visit? Yes, and I think that's one of the issues. The media focuses, uh, you know, the, atten the uh, attention attenuates uh, after it's old, old news, but uh, the, the continuation of the exercises shows that uh, China is really trying to make a big statement here. But I think that's what it is. Uh, it's a really an internal issue in China. Uh, the leader there, uh, the strongest Chinese leader uh, since Mao Zedong uh, was in power. Uh, who has consolidated power and is really taking the country back to, you know, commu real communism instead of the partial communism that Deng Xiaoping had uh, uh, instituted in the late 70s, early 80s, and which has made China prosper, which meant introduction of some capitalism. He has taken the country back to a hard, more hardline, both economically and politically, uh, communist regime. And he is uh, now breaking an informal limit by trying to get a third term uh, in the National Party Congress to do that is coming up here in the fall. And he's, be, he's been weakened by his COVID lockdowns and, of course, the economic slowdown that that has, uh, has occurred because of that. So he, he needs something uh, weak leaders at home often lash out overseas. And, and of course, they're waiting for some sort of a provocation to do this. I think I think it was pre-planned. Uh, but regardless of whether it was pre-planned or not, uh, Nancy Pelosi came along. And certainly uh, she has a right to visit Taiwan, as does any leader. It's a, it's a free country, as they say. Uh, and uh, she may have picked a bad time to do that. And uh, given uh, leader Xi and China, uh, a reason to do what he's doing, but certainly, um, certainly, this is an overreaction. I, I think, as you pointed out in your statement, yeah, a remarkable overreaction. I mean, apparently, uh, they did these war games around Taiwan, simulating an attack from six different locations from all sides of the island, and there was actually a missile that was. Uh, flown over the island. Am I right about that? Yes, that's the first time they've actually shot a missile over Taiwan itself. 
And that's the first time also five missiles uh, uh, landed in the Japanese economic zone. That's a first as well. So they're trying to show that they mean business. And they're also trying to show with the Japanese, um, you know, missile droppings, if you want to call them, mm-hmm. uh, that they they can hit Japanese bases. And if the United States went to war with China, of course, the U.S. would be using a lot of military bases in Japan. So I think they wanted to make that clear uh, by firing missiles that way. Um, I, have a, I have a question for you. How much, this is a judgment call, of course, do you think that Taiwan has made itself very difficult to swallow? How much has it uh, turned itself into a porcupine? Or are the people there a bit complacent about the situation and perhaps now going to change their mind? Well, I think the Russian invasion of the Ukraine is you know, awakened a lot of sentiment in Taiwan and Chinese threats as well have been amping up that they could be next. And so I think certainly the government, uh, the Chinese government or the Taiwanese government, um, the the uh, Taiwan is very military reform minded. Uh, The problem is that the Taiwanese military, like many countries, and I would include Russia in this, as as has been demonstrated on the battlefield. So many countries buy high-tech weapons, mainly from the United States, Russia, et cetera, but they don't spend a lot of money on the stuff that really matters when you fight. And certainly technology does matter. I don't want to say that it doesn't, but you have to be able to uh, train on those systems, maintain them, operate them, et cetera. And uh, a lot of countries can't do that. And you also need intelligence. And by uh, as Russia, so we've seen with Russia, you need logistics, logistics, logistics. And uh, uh, there, you need other things as well. And that one of the things that the Taiwanese need is a better mobilization of their population. I think the Taiwanese would fight because as, as time has gone on, you know, the older people in, in Taiwan had come from the mainland, many of them. and. Uh, they, they always kind of had a sentimental reason to reunite with China, even though it was a communist country. But the young people, they don't have that. And as time goes on, a, a smaller and smaller pop- percentage of the population in Taiwan really wants to reunite. And so um, I think they, w- they would definitely fight, but the government has to, you know, provide and plan for that. And I think also the president needs, she needs to, uh, she could be a potential Zelensky, uh, but she needs to uh, make the military uh, do some of these reforms, like uh, buy the things that they need, which are often sometimes cheaper than the high tech items. Uh, And Taiwan also has the problem that for many years, there was a dictatorship. So the the army was more concerned inward than with an invasion from China. So they have to battle that, uh, the culture in the army as well. But I think it's very possible that they could, with US help, uh, be more of a porcupine. And a porcupine means, uh, for people who don't know that military term, doesn't mean that Taiwan is much smaller economically and militarily than China would be able to defeat the Chinese but it means that they could inflict enough damage on the Chinese military to, um, you know, deter it from attacking in the first place. And one one thing that has always the U.S. has always been reluctant to sell to the to the Taiwanese is, is offensive missiles, and there is a very good reason for that because we have an ambivalent policy towards Taiwan, and one of the reasons that we have, in fact, maybe the major reasons of our 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 ambivalent policy that is and it's also ambiguous in that we don't say definitely that we're going to defend taiwan if china attacks it one of the reasons for that is because we don't want taiwan to get cocky and declare their independence which would drive china crazy or take some other provocative action to get to drag the us into a war however our current policy even use those missiles 
right? If yes, we promised to defend them and we gave them these long range missiles, yes, yes. then they might say, oh, OK. Right. But if you don't have that promise and you make clear, listen, over a five year period, we're going to wean you off, off of any dependence you have on us. And we're going to train you and we're going to sell you the stuff that you really need. And we're going to make your military a porcupine. But then you're you're on your own. We're not coming. And we'll even sell you the offensive missiles. But don't don't expect us to come to your defense. And the offensive missiles really would inflict damage on China. And I think they that might uh, dissuade them from from doing anything to Taiwan. About, the, other, how, the, the other question here is, can China really do this? If I were Xi Jinping in China, I would say, wow. The, the system in Russia was very corrupt. They, they, they pretended they were doing training. They were pretended they were buying systems and stuff uh, and doing all this stuff. But a lot of the money that was came from the government went into people's private accounts, I think. And uh, all these generals were corrupt and ineffective. And she should have to wonder, you know, we, we have this system here that has a lot of corruption in it. I wonder if my generals will like that, too. And that's a big problem. The other problem they have is an amphibious assault is very one of the most difficult military operations. D-Day uh, almost failed because uh, and that that was just across the English Channel, which isn't that far, far away from from France. This is 80 miles, but uh, surface ships are very uh, vulnerable nowadays to an attack, as we saw in Ukraine by the sinking of uh, the the, the, the Moskva, Moskva, which is the flagship with a with a homemade uh, Ukrainian missile. So I think they have to be. I'm not sure China could even pull it off at this point. So I, I wonder also about the change in uh, mainland Chinese attitude toward Hong Kong and the so-called promise that if Taiwan were to rejoin China, they would get the one country, two systems uh, chance at having their own rule of law and economic system. And what the, how has that changed Taiwanese attitudes, the Hong Kong? Experience? Well, I think, yeah, I think that's an excellent point because this one country, two systems that China has promised. Taiwan is also was also promised to Hong Kong. And now we see one country, one system in Hong Kong with repression of democracy. And so I think the Taiwanese people have that gives the Taiwanese people an even bigger incentive to push back on something. Uh, and I think you also have to dis discuss, though, <clears throat> short of an amphibious invasion, what if um, China squeezed um, uh, Taiwan just slowly, like a boa constrictor. Uh, well, you know, the, this, those surface ships that are blockading or whatever are very vulnerable. And I, Taiwan also start, should start like the Iranians did, buying sea mines, uh, anti-ship missiles, uh, diesel submarines and small patrol boats, because that's a sort of a layered defense of their country. And uh, they could they could really threaten a blockade or any sort of something Sounds that would also foil an amphibious assault. But it would also make the Chinese very, um, you know, a cautious about uh, instituting any sort of permanent blockade on Taiwan. So if we think of uh, the Chinese using Speaker Pelosi's visit as a pretext for something that they probably had on hair trigger anyway to do these military exercises. Uh, it's also been alleged that we have a pretext situation here in the United States with regard to Mar-a-Lago, that the supposed search for missing or absconded with documents, apparently they <clears throat> took a uh, a birthday party menu and a cocktail napkin from President Trump's house. Uh, but anyway, uh, that there might be a pretext here. Well, they, I think they have certainly Trump violated the uh, Presidential Records Act because you're not supposed to take any uh, records. And they 
already took 15 boxes of records and there was some highly classified information, uh, probably code word or black information there. And so they didn't have it in any sort of a skiff or a storage facility, which is authorized for that. So uh, the problem that you have is uh, Trump kind of spilled the beans uh, on is some uh, Israeli intelligence that was highly classified intelligence to the Russians one time in the Oval Office. Uh, whether he did it on purpose or accidentally, I think he was sort of boasting that the United States knew it. So he's not always been very conscious of those things. So, so, and and apparently he was reluctant to give some of it up. So now that then they took another twelve boxes. I think there, there's not really enough information to know if they made a mistake or not. But certainly, any other person would probably be under indictment for that, uh, for just gross negligence. But, you know, he's a former president, so. Um, but, you know, it, it seems to me that uh, the situation is more serious than that because as Andrew McCarthy, the former federal prosecutor and uh, writer for National Review and longtime commentator on Fox News has said, the real pressure on Merritt Garland is to somehow indict and try to prosecute President Trump in relation to the January 6th riot. And they have gotten some interesting things out of these hearings, but they don't really have a damning smoking gun. And so if you go in, so he points out, you can go before a judge and say, Oh, we want, you know, we think there's drug evidence, and here's the reason why we think that. But you're really looking for evidence in a murder. Well, in this case, according to McCarthy, uh, they put up this a documents thing, which normally would be negotiated or satisfied through a subpoena from a grand jury. And they use this, and they use the doctrine of plain sight, which means anything they find lying around, it becomes a supposed search warrant for a specific thing becomes like the kind of general warrant that the U.S. did the uh, Revolutionary War against the British for, where the British would say one thing, and they just take everything from these Bostonians' houses that it interested them. So they, they, the FBI has, ad, has acknowledged that it used an injudicious, this is a term of art, approach in loading up these boxes. They didn't look at what they were taking. They just took everything. Well, I think they did. They normally do that. If they don't have time, even during a 10-hour search, which is what it was to look at every everything. But I mean, what we'll have to say, uh, certainly that's a technique they used. And then there's also another thing that they call it the Al Capone theory of prosecution. And that is right. if you want to get somebody on bigger charges, but you can't, you know, like how Al Capone was guilty a of murderer, many murders, right. they got him on tax evasion. So what right. you're saying, there is a problem. And I think it is sort of a general, general warrant, but that, that, that has not uniquely applied to Trump that's used by right. uh, as a societal problem that. Yes, I think it's shouldn't. something we, we yes. all three of us are not happy about this than the way it happened. I also think there's been a misleading thing where people have said, well, is this Records Act says that you, you, you can't uh, hold office in the United States if you're in violation of the Records Act. But uh, people, scholars have pointed out that the courts, in the case of Adam Clayton Powell and in other cases, have said, look, <coughs> if the Constitution sets out the eligibility for office, the, a federal statute cannot <coughs> overcome that, cannot. Uh, somehow stand in the way of that. So the eligibility for president of the United States is set forth in the eligibility clause of the Constitution, and this federal statute cannot override that and would not. So that's, that's, true, so that's, the, that's true, but the 14th Amendment, uh, if in case you're engaged in rebellion or insurrection, uh, uh -huh. you can do that, and that's in the Constitution, the 14th uh -huh. Amendment. Uh -huh. So if they could find something like that, yeah, right. if they could find something to, like that, they could probably make it stick. Right. If they found a document <clears throat> saying, 
I hereby want you to engage in armed rebellion. <laughs> I guess the, that's a different matter. Yeah, but I mean, but I don't but think Bill, they're going to find that. But the thing, so, the thing is, Bill, you 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 started out by on this subject by pointing out that it appeared to be a kind of pretext, and maybe that's maybe. what Ann, maybe that's what Andrew McCarthy's point is too. Yes. <clears throat> but that's why you know we just don't know enough we to don't. draw conclusions yet. I I'm ambivalent because on the one hand, I mean. Uh, the rule of law is extraordinarily valuable, and I really love the fact that in the United States in general, no one is above the law. <clears throat> That's a good thing. But at the same time, uh, the equitable rule of law means that there's not favoritism, nor is there sort of selective prosecution. Right. So if under the Archives Act, which was mentioned a moment ago, Trump is being somehow selectively prosecuted where others apparently have not been. Right. That How about Sandy like Berger? It. How about Hillary Clinton? How yeah. about General Petraeus? <laughs> yeah. So the e even-handed rule of law is the ideal to aspire to and to conform to as much as possible. But is Donald Trump being selectively singled out? I don't know. <clears throat> I can't help but wonder. Well, it's too too early to tell that. I think you're right, Graham. The other the other thing is Petraeus and Berger were actually uh, you know convicted of of doing that. So. Uh, now you, you say, well, they didn't really get that high a punishment, but maybe Trump but they didn't get be. they didn't get a search warrant with thirty agents carrying machine guns, right? Well, in the case of <clears throat> in the case, they, they both admitted that they did it. Right. That Petraeus gave it to his girlfriend. This code word oh, intelligence that's right. information, and uh, Berger was stuffed stuff in his pants and his socks. And try to <laughs> physically carry it out of the uh, and, uh, well, and, and, may, and, and may have tampered with yes. things. In yes, other and words, it was caught. There might yes. have been a, a passage in there that said, you know, something about Osama, and then somebody said, "Oh, we don't need to worry about him," and so they wanted to get rid of that. <laughs> but then, of anyway, course, recently who knows? there are That's these totally speculative. I'm not saying there was such a thing. Recently, there are these photographs that have been published of White House toilets uh, yeah. showing things which Donald Trump allegedly ripped up and tried to flush down the toilets. Again, National It was like Archive. something having to do with Ellen's the panic, though. I mean, I just... I, the, guy, yeah. the guy is not a scrupulous rules keeper. And also, <clears throat> I would add that when all these thousands of presidential appointees leave, at the end of an administration, they're supposed to mm -hmm. give their documents all right. over to the archives. Mm -hmm. and But they take some home, and some of them are thinking of writing a book, and so they're probably a little more egregious about taking things home. And this stuff should be given to the archives, but not all of it is. And if it's missing, then they should negotiate over it. They shouldn't. Well, I, they, I think with Trump, they did, they did negotiate with them. Well, and they, 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 they got, they, they went there in June. They looked at the stuff that was there. They could have <clears> gotten more. There's, the New York Times has a whole timeline today, and it doesn't look to me like they had a good reason to do this. Well, the archivists, they have, to be, the showing, they have were... to be showing that he's about to destroy the evidence. The yeah, well, that's, a, that's City. what you have to get for a warrant well, like how, that. But we don't how, know that he wasn't he do, trying to do that either. How could he be doing that? He was in New York City. Well, not at the moment, but Eric Trump was there and, the, and uh, his, his staff was there. So he, he could easily commission people to yeah, do it. Okay. Yeah. Well, they better, have, they better have evidence of something really bad being missed there in hiding. And they better have pretty solid evidence in their affidavit that somebody was on the verge of destroying it. You, you Otherwise, know this is going to be what the critics have said. In other words, Marco Rubio has said this is just like Nicaragua. Uh, multiple people, including the Wall Street Journal's editorial, has said this is crossing the Rubicon. In other words, it's like I C think Caesar they're hyperventilating. The okay. Yeah, I but mean, I, there I are procedures in force in all these matters that were not in effect in Nicaragua. I'm just telling you, you can get. A, um, a magistrate judge to agree to any search warrant of uh, 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 this sort of pretext. <laughs> well, I think that any judge is going to be a little leery of just rubber stamping it in this case, since it's a well, political has, time has bomb. The, has the FBI a recent history of like the last seven years <clears throat> of 
going after Donald Trump, a man with flaws, of course, on all sorts of pre pre uh, pretexts and <clears throat> lies and manufactured uh, arguments and so forth. Yes, it does. And so, sadly, I think. I think the Justice Department better have something really big here, because well, otherwise that's... they're going to have a martyr on their hands running for president. Well, if and you want to people... hear my wild theory of the case, which nobody sure. has okay. mentioned, yeah, we we I... do want to hear it. We want okay. to hear it. Okay, then we'll. I think it. this. I think <laughs> they can. Uh, this is the charge that's pretty cut and dried. I mean, if he had classified information, highly classified, and the National Archives has already said he had highly classified information there in the first 15 boxes that he turned in. So they have a, probably a clear cut case on this narrow item. And I think what they're trying to do is they know he's going to declare for presidency the, for, as a candidate for presidency. And part of that is to keep, you know, to keep away the investigators and, and lawyers that are chasing him. But what they can do is if they can beat him to that with this cut and dried charge and indict him, then they can build on that. And if there's anything else that comes along, like January 6th or, you know, this uh, Georgia case, you know, they can they can because uh, he was monkeying with not only a, a state election, but the federal election, if he was doing that. And it seems like he certainly had an incriminating phone call there. So then they can add all that stuff later is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. uh, and they beat him as a kid. And they could say, well, no, we, he wasn't a candidate when we, but, you know, that's my I, theory. I, Ivan, I think there's a lot to what you're saying, but I'm, I'm sure if a jury considers something like find, find those 100,000 votes that are sitting around somewhere, it doesn't necessarily mean make those votes up and insert them. It could mean, I'm pretty sure from our polling data and the trajectory of votes in that state, that there is somewhere something that's been neglected in counting. It, you can't, unless the man yeah, could said, mean that. <clears throat> there are a multiple plausible <clears throat> interpretation. Well, except he mentioned a very specific number, which is one more vote than he got. So, <laughs> right, I mean, right. if you just want to say, hey, I'm sure we won this thing. Can you recount it again? I'm sure we can get over the limit or something. That's one thing. But he said, I want to, you to find 11,318 or whatever it was, you know, vote, which is one more than he, than he okay. got. So. Well, I, I, I'm, sh I'm sure that a, a well, prosecution would love your theory, but I, I, you know they they have to convince a jury. So yeah, well, they listen, do. That's the that's the that's the, the issue. Yeah, on the point of <clears throat> whether they've had sufficient justification for the raid uh, just uh, implemented at Mar-a-Lago, I thought it was pretty fascinating that former governor of New York uh, Andrew Cuomo issued a statement yesterday saying, "quote." Uh, DOJ must immediately explain the reason for its raid and must be more than search for inconsequential archives or it will be viewed as a political tactic and undermine any credible future investigation of the January 6th investigation. That's of course, if they did that, then they would hit them for, you know, the reason, one of the reasons that the, <clears throat> that the Justice Department does, does that is supposed to be not drag people through the mud who they're just investigating, but they don't have enough evidence to prove so if you come if you, uh, trump blew the whistle on this uh, investigation because one of the reasons i think because he knew that the justice department probably under mark garland probably wasn't going to say too much about it and that's how comey got in trouble you know with a lot of people for you know saying too much about hillary clinton he should have just said well we're not indicting her but whatever you know so they the bureaucracies tend to react to the last issue and mm -hmm. the last mm -hmm. issue was comey getting, uh, you know, dragged through the mud, if you will, uh, and maybe deserved it, but saying too much about the, def the defendant uh, in, the, in the case. Um, and so I think uh, this, is a, this is actually can be used as a way to give people the benefit of the doubt until, you know, they'll either come back and say, you know, all this will be uh, made public, the, not only the search warrant, but the affidavit, which is a real key thing. Search warrant could be very brief. And you might, you might get something from the inventory of what they took, 
but the affidavit that the FBI agent or agents had to swear to the judge, that would be really that's the why most important, doing, interesting right? thing. Yeah. Yes. So if they charge him, they'll have to make that public. But if they don't charge him, that's probably in Trump's advantage, maybe uh, because, you know, he doesn't they're not going to say, well, we could have got him on this. But, you know, like Comey did with uh, Clinton. Mm -hmm. You know, so the I'd thing like is, to, the I'd chemistry like to, of the situation, I, just one, last, one last comment on that, if I may, Bill, the chemistry of the Donald Trump situation seems to me is such that um, because we're talking about a character who does, admittedly, most people admit, he has a tendency to cut corners and be a little less than entirely forthcoming, shall we say, those who oppose him, <clears throat> therefore, as a result of that, face a great temptation because they want to nail him. And so th they face the temptation of trying to cut corners and be not entirely honest and scrupulous in the procedures because he is the same way, they feel. So there's a temptation to try and get at him. But it seems to me that if, if we're really to uphold the rule of law, uh, the Department of Justice and the FBI and others have to be extraordinarily careful to follow every appropriate procedure, every equitable practice in these matters, and not try and cut corners on the mistaken idea that somehow they don't have to be totally honest since Donald Trump isn't totally honest. I don't want our justices to fall into that, that morass. Um, so, so, Graham, to echo you in your point about constitutional norms and the rule of law, there's also a practical political side to it that, but that echoes you that the Wall Street Journal has had in its editorial where it says, uh, they, it says, this, meaning what just went on at the Mar-a-Lago, risks compounding the baleful pattern of the last six years. Mr. Trump is accused of violating political norms, sometimes fairly, sometimes not, in terms of the accusation. And the left then violates norms in response. Yeah. This is your point. That's my Polarization point. <laughs> increases and public faith in institutions and peaceful settlement of political differences erodes further. So, but well, I guess we'll stand by. <laughs> yeah, that's right, and, and not not draw hasty conclusions. But let's just hope that our public servants hold on and follow the scrupulous path of procedure and law. No in the, whom in they're the meantime, doing. the Biden White House is keeping quiet about this, but is trumpeting the job situation, the uh, the slight dip in gasoline prices, and its new version of Build Back Better, which they are calling the Inflation Reduction Act. So probably we should turn to that. Yeah, let's talk about that. I mean, uh, it's called the Inflation Reduction Act, but inflation has just come in at, what, 8.5%. And, and the reason that it, it's 8.5 rather than 9 point something is primarily, I think, because gasoline has dropped a bit. Uh, other prices seem to be soaring at a faster clip than that. So Americans are reeling uh, from inflation. Uh, apparently, unemployment is down, um, but the Biden administration is trying to make the most of the one and make the least of the other and denying that there's a recession at work here or brewing. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act looks to me like it's kind of a misnomer. Am I right about that, Bill? Uh, I think so. Um... A group of 230 economists signed an open letter saying that this was not going to improve the inflation situation, that it would, in fact, discourage investment, that it would uh, end up starving the, private, the productive private sector of funds and turn them over to the unproductive public sector. I think before we uh, accept the administration's point about jobs and unemployment, we need to remember both that the labor participation rate, so what portion of the able population that could be holding jobs is holding jobs, that is still down. It's down from before COVID-19 and it's going down also right now. It's been zigzagging a bit, but anyway, it's on a downward trend now. And it's also very clear that the benefits available and other programs of the government is discouraging, not encouraging people to return to the workforce. So there's that side of the situation. Then there's this new bill, the Inflation 
Reduction Act, or I, I call it the Prosperity Reduction Act. But <laughs> That's a good one, Bill. <laughs> so there's price controls on pharmaceuticals. This has to do with the way the government negotiates the prices on them. And that's going to discourage pharmaceutical companies from pursuing drugs for Lou Gehrig's disease, for Parkinson's disease, for cancer, for uh, any number of things, epilepsy and so forth. This is Stephen Moore's list of things that are being pursued. And we won't get, we'll lose lives and we'll be taking money from an unproductive, from a productive part of the economy, the pharmaceutical part, and transferring it to an unproductive part, the climate reduction, climate control industry, and where the government tends to put money in cylindras, namely sort of pet projects that don't pan out become kind of financial black hole. The, tax, the taxes that are in this uh, are going to discourage uh, private companies and, and their successful endeavors. They, they claim that it's only going to fall on the very rich people making over $400,000 a year, but taxes on corporations uh, fall on stockholders, so that's all over the economy. People are in pension plans and retirement plans and so forth. And uh, also they fall on the, the workers and the consumers. So they don't, there's no really such thing as corporation. It's only people. And so these are who get affected. And, uh, you know, 87,000 new IRS agents are funded through this. There's Somehow a, I don't feel secure and happy about having 87,000 new IRS This is double IRS their agents. current workforce. There was a meme going on, on the there's a meme on the internet that shows a giant football stadium in Oklahoma, and it says, you know, it's totally full of people, and it says the new staff of the IRS is yeah. bigger can, could not fit in this stadium. Unbelievable! So it's more than the State Department, the CIA, and the Border Patrol combined. Unbelievable! Now they say they're only going to go after in these audits. Um, the, the wealthy people making over four hundred thousand dollars a year, but there's two problems with this. We have the past record of IRS audits, and there's only so many rich people, and so you know they don't they don't the ma majority of these audits in the past, the vast majority, have not been against the very wealthy. As I said, there are not that many of them. And, you know, it's more middle class people and small businesses that they go after. And also before this, before the state, sorry, before the White House started saying they're only going to go after people, incomes over 400,000, the IRS had projected what they were going to use all these additional people for. And it was clear that they were going to go after the businesses and small businesses and middle income people. So. Anyway, maybe it, will, in mind maybe, it that, will, maybe it will only be people making over 400000 Well, maybe, but keep in mind that many audits- They have audits rights too. <laughs> they do, but keep in mind that many audit situations are precisely about <clears throat> how much income does a person exactly. actually have. <laughs> exactly. And if someone is somewhere you know, hovering between two and five and there's a dispute going on, uh, they're going to tackle people who actually may end up actually having less than 400 but hey, too late. All the extra manpower had to be devoted to cases like that, and uh, it's going to be it, it, it's going to be a little bit risky. I wonder um, if they I don't know what to what extent the IRS is politicized, but just as a, I don't mean partisan, but politicized in that you know rich people have can hire right. teams of lawyers, and it's harder to prosecute them, and so just by bureau, bureaucratic uh, use of well, they say, well, that, it's going to be tough to get this guy. Let's, let's go to the, low, the next tier down. And right. we have a better chance using our resources to get a conviction of these guys who don't quite have as much money. So I just wonder, you know, how, how that's going to I think that's out. a good way of anal analyzing it. The, the, it's usually the, defenders, the, politics the defenders of the Biden administration claim, yes, well-to-do people have these army of lawyers and accountants, 
So we are going to use this money to develop our own team of accountants and lawyers to counter that. I think, but I think the actual incentive of a bureaucratic environment is precisely what Ivan says. That they're going to, they're going to, what they're going to want is their scores, and their scores are convictions and numbers of people giving in money. Yes, they'd like some big fish, but they'd rather have, you know, instead of 300 rich people, they'd rather have 5,000 middle income. Uh, well, it's like, the, it's like the meter it's maid. A, she, gets, she gets paid depending on how many tickets she issues, right? In the parking lot, and not to whether it's a Cadillac or a Volkswagen. That's right. That's right. Anyway, I have a question about the uh, taxes. Obviously, you know, taxes, tax increases are never, never good for other reasons. But uh, what about their argument that well, we've got tax increases. That's gonna, that's fiscal policy that's going to slow the economy and uh, help with inflation. Well, why not just slit our throats? That will slow the economy. Yeah, but I think they're. I, I, yeah, that's right. There are people who say that. I just think it's ca- it's like counterproductive. I think mm-hmm. you'd rather have a productive economy and halt the increase of the money supply. That's mm-hmm. what you should do. I would like to point out too that, um, as Bill mentioned in passing a few minutes ago, the portion of the reconciliation bill touching on. Uh, Drug prescription drugs and so forth is especially counterproductive. Our senior fellow, John C. Goodman, has just published a piece in Forbes, which is available on our website, independent.org, in which he analyzes that portion of the legislation. And he points out that the new restrictions for Medicare beneficiaries are going to lead to fewer new drugs, fewer cures, more avoidable deaths, as he puts it, and higher drug prices for the private sector, um, just as a lot of this extra spending. Uh, of the bill more generally is going to lead to more inflation, more uh, pressure on uh, the treasury to expand the money supply. Uh, this, this is not going to work out well, and no amount of nice names and adjectives put on top of it is really going to change that. It's just the underlying economic reality. So with that said, <clears throat> um, if the Democratic Party presently seems to be committed to a course of action that is going to put further pressure on consumers, taxpayers through inflation and taxes, um, et cetera. Uh, Is it any wonder, as some have pointed out, that uh, Latin American uh, Uh, You're not going to call them Latinx? I'm not going to call them Latinx, but I am going to say Latin Latin origin citizens are going to be pressed and turned. White urban mm-hmm. intellectuals want to call them Latinx. They do, I know, and but, but of Latinos, Latinos don't like the word Latinx. Two percent <laughs> of Latinos want to be called that. Yeah. So, and, one and of, you know, one of, so, so there's a, a very well-known political scientist named... Uh, uh, You're talking about name. Rui Teixeira. Right, Rui Teixeira. So he wrote a famous book, co-authored a famous book called The Emerging Democratic Majority. But now he's baleful and pessimistic about such democratic majority. And he's just left the Center for American Progress, where he was for many years, saying it's consumed by political correctness and infighting over recherche doctrinal matters. And he's moved to the American Enterprise Institute. And he's given several interviews and written several articles in recent times about how uh, Democrats are losing support among Latinos. And Biden is now at 19% approval among Latinos. Now, the Democrats, wow. there are states that are on the borderline that are contestable in a presidential election where this slip in Latino support <clears throat> will lose them the state. So why, why is this happening? Well, Teixeira says the Democrats have an image about not caring about getting criminals off the street. As this example of Latinx shows, the, the people in the Latino community think that these progressives are in some never-never land. Their jargon is alien. Their lingo is very strange. And they don't so, say, seem to have any idea of what kind of concerns are on the minds of 
regular <laughs> Latinos. I mean, L Latinos want lower crime. They want effective schools. They're, this is the sort of thing that they're interested in. And that the, the, so uh, another interesting thing that, he, that uh, Teixeira brings up is that there's polling data that shows that Latinos don't, by and large, believe in this structural racism, critical race theory idea that embedded in all American institutions is a racist ammunition of people of color. And instead, Latinos tend to think that there are individuals out there, sometimes they're just you know, day to day individuals without power, sometimes they're people with power who do maybe exercise power or influence in some racially oppressive or discriminatory way. And that's the problem, those individuals, and not that American institutions are hopelessly corrupt and need to be overthrown. So since these progressives are advancing the structural racism theory, including uh, you know, President Biden sometimes talking about it, uh, they are, again, alienating themselves from the Latino population. Keep in mind, too, just for those who may be wondering what our banter about Latinx was, not everyone understands what's going on here. Uh, because the Spanish language uh, is from its origins in Latin, it's a gendered language in so many ways. Uh, Latino is the masculine. Latina is the feminine. But Latino is used as the inclusive term as it is in English and other respects. So that when you hear progressives say, oh, we should only say Latinx, that's because they're basically saying that the Spanish language is bigoted, and we don't like the Spanish language. We don't like Spanish culture because it affirms through its, its grammar somehow the inclusive character of the masculine term. Uh, it's really a kind of declaration of war on uh, Hispanic culture and Spanish language when they use the term Latinx. Is it any wonder that Latinos don't like the term Latinx? It's pretty, it's pretty highly charged accusation against their own culture. So another issue is for Latinos and for working class voters and other voters is the abortion one. So this is fraught with peril. It's possible among the three of us we have disagreements. But if you look at polling data, uh, it's clear that the public thinks that you should be able to have an abortion in the first three months. And that after that, you should be able to have an abortion in a case of rape or incest or a serious threat to the life of the physical threat to the life of the mother. And, you know, the Democrats, instead of taking that approach, are determined to have full and complete, you know, two seconds before delivery abortions which go beyond what the bulk of the public wants. Now, Republicans have the opposite problem. So the Republicans that want to say, you can't have an abortion the moment there is conception, uh, have the same problem. But the, the point is that the Latinos, uh, whom the Democrats had counted on for important margins of support, see uh, an exaggerated, view of abortion among the political elites in the Democratic Party. And again, not to say that Republicans don't have a problem in this area too. Now that, you know, the Supreme Court has said this has to be democratically decided at the state level. Uh, it, anyway, it's a problem for the Democrats with the Latinos. It really is. Yeah. I mean, on that subject, I would just point out that so long as it's true that the unborn entity um, only becomes human after the third month, um, that polling data may be a good solution. But I'm not sure that the polling data determines the actual no, nature of, no, the, no. of we, the pre we can argue. Entity. We can argue <laughs> on exactly that point. And people will. But it's but, fascinating. But I'm just saying it's politically right. oh, that's I agree the with sign that. of the problem. Yeah, it really is. Hey, you wanted to say something about Argentina, Bill. Shall we go there for a minute? Yes, I think so. It's interesting. So. It isn't often that you get extensive coverage in the news pages of the New York Times and of the Financial Times in London about domestic economic policy in Argentina. I'm not saying they would never cover it, but 
there have been big stories about demonstrations, about splits in the ruling Peronista party. So these are the heirs of the military dictator Juan Perón of the 1940s, who was a kind of somewhat of a follower of Mussolini and Franco, who's kind of a toned down fascist, I think it's fair to say. So he had ultra-nationalist views combined with kind of le leftist socialistic economic policy. So they're, been, so they're divided between the Peronistas in Argentina are divided between people who want to, you know, liberalize the economy, make it more rational, stop a huge amount of subsidies and huge amount of uh, welfare payments. And those who want to continue with them and say, well, you know, we're just going to do this. So they're totally divided. Their demonstrations, people are turning to all the things that happened during high inflation. So the story, like in the New York Times, was you think 9%, that's what we have in the United States, inflation is bad. Imagine 90%. Mm. Okay. So they're not at 90%, but they're projected to get there. So, uh, you know, people are buying things as quickly as they can before the money loses its value. <laughs> there are barter clubs emerging where, you know, you change chopping wood for a dentist, taking care of your teeth, all that sort of stuff going on. Uh, there, there's a tendency in personal lives for people to live for today, to not care about the future, they're not having living for tomorrow and saving and things like that, because if they save the money, just completely worthless. Obviously, the traditional widows and orphans being hurt, people living on fixed income. And, you know, I, I just think the thing is that this is a country where there is revolutionary potential. People yes. are really dissatisfied and upset about this. And uh, I know I, I just say sit down strikes, massive thousands and thousands of people demonstrating, <clears throat> no clear <throat> way out of it that's really going to work. Uh, it could get very ugly. It could indeed. Listen, you know, um, we've covered some interesting territory, but if you don't mind, I would like to circle back to where we started today's conversation because there's a couple details. Uh, speaking, speaking of you know looming problems that uh, come to my mind with regard to China and Taiwan again, and I want to take advantage of Ivan Elon's presence today. You made an interesting remark, Ivan, that not all of our viewers would fully appreciate. And the remark was this: you pointed out that uh, current Chairman Xi Jinping is in a politically uh, vulnerable, politically precarious position, which may make him overreact. Okay, that's important. But what you said was that, that his, his position today has to do with his reversal of some earlier policies. Many people don't realize what you alluded to, and I wish you would talk about it. You alluded to the fact that after the Maoist era was somehow over, Deng Xiaoping instituted a kind of capitalization of China, which led to a dramatic improvement uh, in the economy and the lives of millions of poor Chinese, which has then been reversed. Can you tell our, our viewers and, and me a little bit more about what happened, uh, how China toyed with capitalism for some decades, and why it reverted back to more centralized control, and what that means. Yes, well, Deng Xiaoping was never, he wasn't uh, willing to go and completely just, you know, free up the economy. You still have a lot of state-owned industries which are left over from his period. But what he did do was, you know, more medium size and and mom and pop uh, businesses, which there now are huge numbers in China, he freed up the market for, uh, to some extent for those. And you saw the explosion of Chinese ingenuity and um, you know ambition there. And uh, China has you know since then grown at un unbelievable uh, rates, even I think higher than most developing countries which tend right, to grow up right. grow mm -hmm. faster than your industrial economies which are more mature but uh, what what's happened is not only has he 
he he had these state owned companies and they've been uh, they're ba- a lot of them are zombie companies and they're held up by loans from zombie banks, a state owned bank. So there's <laughs> okay. the first problem. And then mm-hmm. the second problem is he has uh, started. More, he's done more favoritism to we're, certain we're businesses. On she now. We're not. Dong Xiaoping is now dead in your story. Yeah, yes. She, she, she's in Jing, she. right. Yes. She has uh, not only kept the state-owned uh, industries, but all these uh, state-owned banks have, have made a lot of bad loans to these banks. And so that's a precarious uh, uh, issue. But he's also, um, she has also... Uh, <clears throat> uh, gone to favoring certain corporations over others, sort of the some, it's not the exact identical of the Japanese model, but, you know, he's definitely favoring certain corporations, uh, ones that the state thinks are strategic. And of course, the state is always badly bad at uh, identifying Predicting these. That, yes. right. And then he's also, even on corporations that are still relatively government free, <laughs> He is now putting commas up, political commissars, uh, just like the old days with Mao and those people. And so to keep these interests, these uh, private companies from not getting too far away from state interests. So you have in the economy, you have this uh, creeping communism, I would call it, uh, coming back. And then also he's making it more difficult for businesses to operate by uh, increasing surveillance. Uh, increasing the the party's influence in society and mm-hmm. basically, you know, strangling any sort of dissent. There was some dissent in China before he got there, and he's really stamping that out. So, of course, the economy doesn't benefit from that either. Right. The restriction yeah. so, on information and that sort of thing. Right. So, after a few decades of dramatically growing prosperity due to the kind of anti-Marxist policy of allowing private property rights to a much greater degree. Prosperity zoomed, but then when Xi tried to consolidate his power, he's reversing the tide of private property and capitalist prosperity, which has increased his control on society, but also jeopardized Chinese prosperity. Uh, Yeah, and and politically, the the regime uh, has always rested on, since Deng took over, and and the leaders that came after Deng, it's always rested on growth rates. And right. if, you know, now he is, the pandemic isn't the only problem here. As I mentioned, the, right. the high debt levels of banks mm-hmm. and corp- state-owned mm-hmm. corporations. And then you've got the population mm-hmm. problem, where for many years, China had a one-child policy to try to reduce its population instead of expanding its economy. Well, that continued even after the capitalism uh, part, you know, the partial capitalism return. So now they have a big demographic problem where, and of course, you know, they have the pension problem that, that uh, all countries have, but they, are, they also have, you know, too few workers supporting too, too many retirees. Sounds and, familiar. Yes. And so that's another big problem. Their, their demographics are horrible and they would have been anyway, but then they had this one child policy for many years, which has now been finally taken off. But of course, the population is much more uh, affluent, so they tend to have fewer kids anyway. So they're still going to have this uh, ex- exacerbated problem going forward. So the regime, the, uh, the communist regime in Beijing has become a little bit more, oh, what's the word? Fragile, uh, vulnerable? Maybe brittle. Brittle. That's the word I'm looking for. More brittle. Yes. Well, um, it's, and, and- it's always hard to predict when revolution is going to occur, but certainly... Uh, this lockdown, I'm surprised he's continuing that. I guess it's just the authoritarian way of doing things in China because his, his, his whole regime depends on uh, continued economic growth because they're, they're, they know there's massive corruption. And, you know, he, he, had a, he ran a con- corruption campaign when he first came in office. But of course, that was used, that was corrupt in itself and that was used to get rid of his political enemies. And so, there's still a lot of corruption in the Chinese uh, government. So about all he has to do to rely on is increased growth rates. And if those don't happen, he right. can go through a period where he gets more aggressive, at least rhetorically, 
uh, overseas or, you know, in his neighborhood over there. So that's that might be a problem as well. Now, I don't want to overblow the Chinese threat because I think in the long term, these economic problems, it's bad for Chinese people, but it's it might be good for national security for the U.S. since China may be less of a threat, uh, but in the long term, because they don't have as much economic power to throw around. Now, in the short term, though, that if he gets desperate, he might uh, lash out or that's, whatever. That's kind of what I was trying to to think about as you described the situation. A a ruler of a increasingly brittle regime can feel desperate. Uh, yes, and so in that, especially and when so, he's trying so to extend they're using, his term, they're using this to use the Shakespearean phrase: "Busy, giddy minds with foreign quarrels." They're using this Taiwan Straits crisis as a way of distracting from the plateauing of economic growth. Uh, I would also add that the newspapers have had in the last few weeks, and one quite recently, stories about the the uh, uh, trunk and uh, road getting the <laughs> the belt the na- belt and road initiative, initiative. right? Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> so uh, this is Chinese uh, strategic investment overseas in order to advance economic and political hegemony. But they have a huge story in the New York Times about the Kenyan Railroad, which is a mm-hmm. cesspool of corruption. Uh, it's, it doesn't work very well. It just uh, stops. The, fi- the finances. It stops. Yeah. The tracks just stop in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> Good grief. So the, oh, it sounds like California. Yeah, it uh, sounds like our high-speed rail. But anyway, the point is, there's huge uh, Chinese investment there. Uh, Sri Lanka just had a revolution. And again, part of the problem had to do with distortions from the Belt and Road uh, Initiative. So this, they've central plan these economic initiatives overseas. And as Ivan was saying, uh, these plans and initiatives and state bank efforts uh, aren't really good at picking winners. They pick favorites, but they don't pick actual economic winners. Only free market enterprises are going to be successful at doing that. Well, so now I always thought if I might say one thing more about the Belt and Road Project, when I go to conferences and they're always hyping the China threat, they always say, well, you know that they're in Africa, they're in Latin America, they're in Asia, you know, handing out all this money and they're get, get winning a lot more influence than the United States is. And I'm going it, like, it. that's a great thing for us that they're wasting all this money because they're right. also a lot of these countries now that they have taken that they've uh, put in heavy amounts of debt to pay for all this infrastructure that they're, they're now resent the Chinese. And also, they, ha- they hate them in Kenya. Yeah. They're they're shooting at them in Pakistan. Shooting <laughs> at them. So I'm not sure. You know, this this is really going to. I always thought it was going to big boondoggle, and it was probably not going to pay off for them. And I think it's that's not, not basically safe for them in, in Sudan either. Yep, all those places. countries. Yeah. Well, so but just a kind of a concluding thought here, Ivan. Um, on the military side, when you've got a uh, potentially insecure leader whose prosperity base may be vulnerable, who's feeling desperate, uh, some people might say, hey, everybody around the world wants prosperity more than anything else, so no problem to worry about China and Xi Jinping. Uh, This is just the time for the United States to just ramp up the pressure and say, no matter what China does, we're going to stand with Taiwan and fight for Taiwan if or, China invades. Perfect time to do that when he's or, weak. But or, you don't agree with that, do you, Ivan? Or, the, or actually take a military step in response. I'm not joking. You hear know, American pundits, sometimes former yeah, well, Rick, generals. Richard Haas of the Council on Foreign Relations has, has proposed that we go... go Full in on and say we're gonna. Uh, you if China comes after Taiwan, uh, you know we're gonna go all in and defend it. The problem with that is that's what we did in the Cold War, and that's that kind of worked out by hook or by crook. 
But the problem is if deterrence fails, the Chinese care a lot about, more about Taiwan than we do, no matter what our politicians of both parties say. And also, they do have nuclear weapons that can hit our cities. And we have to keep that in mind that just like with Russia in the Ukraine, you know, you can play around a little bit over there, but, you know, eventually you could get into a nuclear war and neither Ukraine nor Taiwan is ultimately strategic to the United States. And I think, you know, you have a lot of politicians that want to do virtual signaling, virtue signaling in national security. And that, you know, they strut around and say, we got to do more and this and that. We're going to stand up to these um, commies or whatever. But the problem is uh, it's not really strategic to the United States. And we need to pick our battles better. Uh, Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq, other disasters that we've had, Somalia, overseas. Uh, we need to really keep our power to dry. In fact, we're, we're not. We don't have 50 percent of the world's GDP like we did at the end of World War II when we had virtually no competitors at all. And I would include the Soviet Union in that category. Uh, now we do have China and uh, we have a Russia, I think, that is over, vastly overstated as the war has shown us. But I think China is probably militarily is overstated as well. But still, they have nuclear weapons and they can hit the U.S. And so we have to be very careful there. And I think there are, are things that we can do to shore up Taiwan and make it a, a, por a porcupine that they can, they can just put a little bit of um, you know, doubt about the Chinese. And I don't even mind uh, selling them offensive missiles, not nuclear missiles, but uh, missiles that'll hit the mainland. But we have, we have to say publicly, listen, we're not defending you. you know, you're on your own, but fill your own defense. You're a, you're a, a uh, rich country. They could even get develop their own nuclear weapons if they wanted to. Ivan Eland is always a voice for prudence and restraint. I appreciate your uh, reminding us of that today, Ivan. I also thank Bill Evers for all of his insight. Um, I'm looking forward to talking to you both again. And I thank all of our friends who may have joined us for this program and remind them that you can always go to independent.org for resources on these subjects, and so many more. Thanks again, Ivan. Good to see you. Good to see you. And Bill. Thank you. Okay, we'll see you all next time. Thanks. Take care, everybody.